In the second part of our Module 1 lecture series, I wanted to talk to you guys about foundations of sound research. So a lot of the things we end up doing in this semester is either creating study designs and or evaluating study designs and understanding the foundations of research will help us in both creating and evaluating. So different types of research is kind of a good place to start, right? Research in, it, in and of itself is a technique used to solve problems that are unanswered by common or expert knowledge. Okay, um, so given that broader definition, we can break this down into historical research, which we look at past events and their effects on present um, other past events or future problems. We could have observational research, um, which is the very common type of research used like in psychology when we just observe what people do and then kind of write down common characteristics that we notice. Okay, but there isn't an intentional manipulation by the investigator themselves. <laughs> Experimental research is what we're focusing on in this class, and that's the process of manipulating variables and events in order to solve a problem. So typically, our primary goal in experimental research is to make a cause and effect inference. Um, in the case of correlations and regressions, we're more so looking at relationships which are not cause and effect, but in either case, we have a type of variable that we've manipulated, and then we want to see how either that variable is related to a certain outcome, or if a variable causes a certain outcome. All right. The scientific method is nothing new to you guys, but this is generally how we create study designs, right? So we start off with some type of observation which usually leads us to creating a research question. We then research that specific topic area to see if we can find out more information about the types of variables that are being used, samples that have been used before, um, if previous research had certain limitations that we can account for in a new study design. Right, so researching the topic area, doing a, a literature review to get more background information on what what it is you're you're trying to question in the universe would be the next step. From that research, you then can create a hypothesis, right? So on informed, an informed decision that or informed a prediction of what you think will occur based on what is known. You then create an experiment to test that hypothesis. From the data that you collect, you analyze it, and then you report your conclusions. Okay, so the statistical part of our class is primarily concerned with analyzing data. Typically what I do is I give you guys the research question, I give you the experimental design and the data, and then we analyze it and report conclusions based on the outcomes that we get from the analyses. Now, a very important component of the this this whole scientific method is the hypothesis. If you know your hypotheses, you'll be able to interpret your results for this class. So when we have a research design, there are two different types of hypotheses um, that we have created. Usually the way that we phrase those hypotheses is going to be based on the type of statistical test we're running. Um, but the two types are a research hypothesis, which is also referred to as the alternate hypothesis. Um, sometimes it's denoted as H sub 1 or H sub A. My um, like intro to statistics professor always called this the ha. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was funny. Um, but alternate hypothesis, that's where the A comes from. Anyways. This research hypothesis is going to prompt your research by predicting the relationships or differences between groups or treatments that you are expecting to see. The mutually exclusive hypothesis to the research hypothesis, or the exact opposite of the research hypothesis, is going to be the null hypothesis. Also um, written as H sub zero, which my statistics professor called the hoe. 
sell. <laughs> I don't know. If you laughed at it, you're going to remember H sub zero is the null. Um, so you have the ha or the ho. Um, and this is what is this is the hypothesis that's actually statistically tested. So when we run all of our analyses, the p-values, which you don't know what a p-value is yet, but the p-values or the results that we get from those statistical tests are always going to be related back to the null hypothesis. Okay, and the null hypothesis is kind of the Debbie Downer of hypotheses, so it always is going to predict that there's no relationship um, between groups or treatments or there is no effect um, if we're looking at cause and effect. Okay. Um, and really what we're saying here is that either um, the relationships or effects that we observe are a result of random occurrence, chance, or error, or that is just what exists in the population. Like that's the, the uh, maybe the intervention that we used is not effective in changing that currently existing relationship. Okay. So null hypothesis and research hypothesis. Within those hypotheses, we have different elements. Um, usually, I will give you guys somewhat of a formulated phrasing for your hypotheses. That way, um, it's, it, it kind of like points you in the right direction on how you write your interpretations. But the two primary components that are going to be in every single hypothesis are your independent variable and your dependent variable. Um, sometimes you might have multiple. But the independent variable is the variable that we intentionally manipulate, or it's the variable that is controlled by the researcher. So oftentimes it'll also be called the predictor variable or the x variable because it's often plotted on the x axis. So if we had a control group versus an experimental group and we wanted to see the effects of a diet program on weight loss. I actually think I use that example later in the lecture. Anyways, the categories that we have, control group and our experimental group, would go on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we would end up comparing how much weight loss actually occurred in the program. So the y variable is our measured variable, also known as the dependent variable. Okay, and the measurements that we get or we collect are like direct changes as a result or their direct outcomes um, as a result of the conditions that we have manipulated with the independent variable. Whew. All right. So usually when we're looking at cause and effect relationships, we have like a formulated phrase where we look at the effect of the manipulated independent variable on the measured dependent variable. Okay. <clears throat> so I have an example in here. Um, if we wanted to look at the effect of time spent in practice on sport performance, okay, using this formula, the effect of time spent in practice, that would be our independent variable. On sport performance, that would be our dependent variable. Okay. So time spent in practice is what we control. Sport performance, oh, well, I don't know how we're measuring that specifically, but however we decide to measure that, that would be the dependent variable. Okay, so let's say that we were using basketball, for example, right? Time spent in practice, most of you are probably thinking like, wait, time is a ratio variable, it's numerical. Um, yeah, but we could say, all right, let's survey a bunch of players and see, like, just have them report how many hours of practice did you spend this week. And then we look at maybe the number of baskets they make in a game, okay? Does the time that they spend in practice positively or negatively correlate with how many points they score in a game? So that, that's one example where you have two ratio type variables, but you have specifically one independent variable that you are controlling, right, which is time spent in practice, and then you're looking at the measurement of sport performance in terms of how many points they make in a game. We could also manipulate 
the time spent in practice. So maybe we say this group practices three hours a week, this group practices six hours a week, and this group practices nine hours a week. And then we compare how many points each of those, or like the average points that each of those groups makes in a game. All right, so there's different ways that we can work through this. I made it a vague example on purpose. Um, but then you ask yourself, if we plotted this data on a graph, which variable would go on the x-axis and which variable would go on the y? Right. So based on our previous slide, time spent in practice, however we're, we're choosing to define that, would go on the x-axis and the sport performance would go on the vertical or the y-axis. The other thing would be what type of data would our measurements classify as. So the first example I gave, if we have time as a continuous scale and we're just taking what people report, that would be an example of ratio data. If we were doing the example of where we have three hours, six hours, and nine hours, those are mutually exclusive categories, so that would be an example of nominal data. Um, in terms of how many points a person scores in a game, that would be an example of ratio data because it a, has a zero starting point. If they make no points, that is, they can't make negative points. It's not like Jeopardy, right? So uh, zero starting point, and then they can go above that in the number of points they score. Okay, so you can try making up different uh, ways that you might measure time spent in practice, different ways you might measure sport performance, and then use those examples and try to categorize your data. Okay. I've got another example um, here. Uh, so again, looking at the effect of diet on weight loss or weight gain. Okay, So based on our formula, diet or type of diet is our independent variable. And the weight loss or gain that we're weight that we're measuring from people would be an example of a dependent variable. Okay. Different ways we could work this, maybe we have people on different types of diets. Maybe we take people, um, we say, what is your, like, we, maybe they have a similar diet or we make them do a control diet for X number of weeks. We look at their weight at the end of that period and then we say, do this other diet and then measure their weight at the end of that. Right, so we could use between subject, we can use within subject, um, types of factors, but diet in and of itself, right, is probably going to be a nominal type of variable, either way you crunch this, this example. And then the weight that we're measuring, this, you could probably argue it in the direction of ratio data, or you could argue it in the direction of interval data but it depends on how you define how you're measuring weight. So if we say we're going to take a baseline weight measurement and then at the end of the intervention we're going to take another measurement, some people's weight might go up, some people's weight might go down. Right? If we're looking at the difference in weights, there's a possibility that we could get a positive value as a result of weight gain, or there's a possibility we could get a negative value as a result of weight loss. So oftentimes when you're taking differences between pre and post measurements, that will result in an interval type of data. If we were saying, um, what is a person's weight at the beginning? What is their weight at the end? And we're not interested in the differences between those two, then that would be an example of ratio data. Um, so the way that we would work that in statistics is we would say, what's the mean or the average weight of our sample at the beginning, what's the average weight at the end? And then when we compare the averages, we could say, all right, well, at the end, it was higher, so people gained weight. Or at the end, the average was lower, so people generally lost weight. All right, so it depends on how you kind of contextualize what your variables are when you're describing your study design. But I, again, make these kind of vague so that you have a lot of different examples. I would pose the same question to you guys and say what if we plotted this these data on a graph, right? The x-axis would have our diets, the y-axis would have our weight measurements. 
And then I've kind of already given you examples of how we would classify our data based on different contexts of measurement. Okay. Um, our final video in this lecture series will be going over quality of research. Um, I'm making it a separate video because the concepts are very related to each other, but it is a little bit lengthy in examples. So uh, go ahead and close this one, and I will see you in the next video.